Okay, we're back. We're gonna go on now with repair of stages of bone wound healing. And first of all, it depends on the type and amount of bone tissue that needs to be replaced. Uh, spongy bone heals faster, but remember, spongy bone makes up only 15% of the bone. Um, so it depends on the blood supply and oxygen to the site. It depends on the presence of growth and thyroid hormones, insulin, we know that's a powerful growth hormone, vitamins and other nutrients, the presence of systemic disease if they have a chronic condition going on, the effects of aging and effective treatment, including immobilization and the prevention of a complication such as infection. So first of all, we have um, um, inflammation and hematoma formation. Uh, where we get what we call a procallus formation by osteoblasts within days of the injury. Osteoblasts, we know, synthesize collagen and matrix, which become mineralized to form a callus. And then once that's done, we have the callus formation, which is, takes weeks to form. It will be reabsorbed and trabeculae are formed along the lines of stress as the, re as the tissue is repaired. Then we have replacement by basic multicellular units of the callus with lamellar or trabecular bone, depending on what type of bone needs to be repaired. A remodeling of the periosteal and endosteal surface of the bone to the size and shape of the bone before injury. And the speed to which a bone heals depends on the severity of the bone disruption um, and et cetera. Everything else that um, I had already said depends on many, many different factors. Okay, so now let's move on to tendylitis, epicondylitis, and bursitis. And we know that um, a tendon is basically uh, where the bone and the, um, 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 the joint meet. Epicondylitis is the area of the humerus radius or ilma and around the knee are the most common. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let's go back. Um, tendonitis is where the, um, the end of the tendon and the bone meet. Epicondylitis is inflammation of a tendon where it actually attaches to the bone. So it's a little bit closer, the epicondylitis to the, from the, joins the tendon and the bone. And epicondylar areas of, um, that usually get this inflammation can be of the humerus, radius, or ulna, and around the knee. Uh, it can happen anywhere, but these are the very, very common sites. Bursa are small sacs lined with synovial membranes so that they're really, really aligning the joint. The synovium is always in the joint. Filled with synovial fluid that are located between the tendons, muscles, and the bony prominences. So the bursa are like cushions for the joint. Commonly occurs in the shoulder, hip, knee, the larger ones, or elbow. Chronic bursitis can result from repeated trauma. Um, one of my brothers, um, oldest of my brothers, was very big, um, very large. He grew quickly. Um, at age 14, he was 6'1". And he was a real big guy, extremely athletic and very coordinated. And he pitched for Servite High School at the time. Um, it was in the late 70s, uh, mid to late 70s. And it was before they had rules where they could actually hurt kids. And because he could throw so hard, they clocked him at 85, 90 miles an hour. And so they used him for pitching over and over and over without him actually being able to relax and, you know, gain some strength back. At any rate, it left, left him with a chronic bursitis throughout his life. And it was just through re repeated use of it. And then septic bursitis is caused by wound infection or bacterial infection of the skin overlying the bursa. So basically, the bursa's primary function is to separate, lubricate, so that the joint can move, lubricate, and cushion these structures. Um, pathophysiology of all of them is tissue degeneration and disorganized collagen formation. We've got inflammatory changes that cause thickening of the sheath, limiting movements, thus causing pain, micro tears causing bleeding and edema, and pain in the tendon, after repeated inflammations, calcium may be deposited in the tendon um, origin area. And, and you know, if we've got deposits of calcium in there, then the, the tendons are not gonna work as if they're at, like they're supposed to. Um, and usually bursitis is an inflammation that is reactive to overuse or excessive pressure. 
the inflamed bristle sac becomes engorged and the inflammation can spread to adjacent tissues. Adjacent just means close. Inflammation of bursa may be decreased with rest, ice, and aspiration of fluid, or to basically stop the activity that's caused, uh, that's brought the bursitis on. Clinical manifestations are the way it looks, um, the way it presents, the symptoms are local tenderness pain with active motion rather than passive. With tendonitis, the pain is localized over the involved tendon. That's basically the difference in this and a fracture. A fracture is going to hurt whether it's at rest or moving. Whereas all of these itises of tendonitis, bursitis, and epicondylitis are going to, they are going to um, have pain with motion, uh, active motion, not passive. Um, with tendonitis, the pain is localized over the involved tendon, um, causes pain and sometimes a weakness and, and limited joint movement. Infectious bursitis is warmth and erythema or redness. Uh, sometimes it can be due to a prior corticosteroid injection uh, can, for severe inflammation. Um, bursitis, the onset of pain may be gradual or sudden, and the pain may limit active movement in the joint. Shoulder bursitis impairs um, arm abduction. My brother got to the point where he couldn't even move his left arm. He was a left-handed pitcher. Bursitis in the knee produces pain when climbing stairs. In the hip, pain will be produced while crossing the legs. Lying on the side of the affected bursa or hip is also painful, obviously. You've got an inflammatory condition going on. Um, evaluation. How are we going to diagnose this stuff? Well, through clinical symptoms or manifestations, a physical exam. Arthroscopy allows an orthopedic surgeon to look inside the knee to help diagnose a problem. Little tiny incisions using a pencil-type instrument called an arthroscope, shows on a camera what the inside of the knee looks like. So the doctor has a clear picture of the inside of the knee. And arthrography, they inject iodine into the knee to produce pictures of the inside of the knee uh, through x-ray. And an MRI, uh, mag magnetic resonance imaging, is a non-invasive diagnostic procedure to scan somewhere in the body or to scan the knee. So you can kind of see arthrography, um, you're injecting iodine in arthroscopy. You're using little tiny incisions. They're a little bit more invasive than an MRI. So how are we going to treat any of these? We're going to immo immobilize the joint with a sling, a splint, or a cast. We're going to use systemic analgesics just to quiet the pain. Ice or heat applications, and we've gone round and round with this one, depending on the doctor, if they just want ice or they just want heat. And I think the common uh, treatment plan right now is they alternate. A lot of them will alternate. They'll have heat on for 20 minutes and then ice for 20, and that's how they do it. Uh, local injection of an anesthetic or a corticosteroid. And they'll use one of the ANES, a, you know, A-I-N-E, uh, for the anesthetic just to, you know, so that you can't feel the pain into the joint. And then the steroid, of course, is going to reduce inflammation. And those are treatment options for that. Okay, we're going to go into um, um, something that's much more severe than any of the tendonitis or bursitis, even though that can really interrupt somebody and, and give people a lot of pain. It's called rhabdomyolysis, myoglobinuria, and the pathophysiology of it. Uh, so rhabdomyolysis, what is it? It's a breakdown of muscle fibers. It results in the release of muscle fibers, and we're going to refer, and those are, that what's released from muscle fibers is myoglobulin, into the bloodstream. It's the breakdown of muscle tissue and it can cause myoglobinuria. Varying amount of muscle protein appears in the urine. Rhabdo usually follows major, major muscle trauma, especially a mu mu muscle crush injury, long distance running, exposure to electric shock and cause extensive muscle damage. Some of these are harmful to the kidney and can cause kidney damage because you've got these large myoglobulin particles going through the glomeruli and there's no room for them, so they damage them. When muscle damage occurs, the protein pigment called myoglobulin is released and filtered through the kidneys. The myoglobulin or this protein pigment can break down into harmful compounds resulting in acute tubular necrosis or ATN. Um, which is renal failure, into the muscle, which can reduce the fluid volume of uh, the body, leading to shock and reduce blood flow to the kidneys. And then um, 
let's see, where are we with this? Um, yeah, muscle damage with the disruption of a sarcolemma. And the sarcolemma is just a cell membrane of a muscle cell. So cell membrane of a muscle cell releases the myoglobulin, which starts the whole process. So forms of how, how myoglobinuria even persists, exists, manifests, shows itself. Um, the most severe form is called a crush syndrome. And it gained notoriety in the reports of injuries seen after the London air raids in World War II. Uh, individuals were found unresponsive and immobile for long periods of time, usually after could have been overdoses. It could be a, crushing, a building falling on somebody, a car crushing someone. Um, it can be found through viral infections, administration of statins, that's cholesterol-lowering medications, certain anesthetic drugs, cocaine, amphetamine, heroin, strychnine, poisoning, alcoholism, tetanus, and you can just read the rest. Um, uh, electroconvulsive therapy and high-voltage electrical shock are associated with severe and sometimes fatal myoglobinuria. Again, that's why we don't really use it anymore. We used to use it for our psychiatric uh, patients. But it's a very, very severe condition with severe consequences uh, because of the whole kidney problem. Um, so crush injury is compression of extremities or other parts of the body that cause muscle swelling and or neurological disturbances in the affected areas of the body. While crush syndrome is localized crush injury with systemic manifest manifestations. So I'll say that again. Uh, crush injury is compression of extremities or other parts of the body that cause muscle swelling and or neurological disturbances in the affected areas of the body, while crush syndrome is localized crush injury with systemic manifestations. Cases occur commonly in catastrophes such as earthquakes or victims that have been trapped under fallen masonry. Less severe and more localized forms are called compartment syndromes. It can lead to a Volkman ischemic contracture in the forearm or the leg, Clinical manifestations. What does this look like? What are the symptoms? Visible dark reddish brown pigmentation of the urine. Renal threshold of myoglobin is 0.5 milligrams of urine. And that equals only 200 grams of muscle that needs to be damaged to cause visible changes in the urine. So you can imagine if you've got massive damage, what that's gonna hap what's going to happen with the myoglobin. Along with the release of myoglobin, uh, we've got CK or creatine kinase and other serum enzymes are released in massive quantities. Uh, creatine kinase, not to be mixed up with creatinine. This is different. This is an enzyme. Uh, creatine kinase level may reach 2,000 times the normal, 5 to 25 units uh, for women and 5 to 35 units for men. Loss of potassium, phosphate, nucleotides, cre creatinine, and creatine. The risk of renal failure increases directly with the height of serum, creatine, kinase, potassium, and phosphorus levels. So evaluation and treatment priorities uh, in treatment of myoglobinuria include identifying and treating the underlying disorder and preventing life-threatening renal failure. Malignant hyperthermia and myoglobinuria can be treated by infusing dantrolene, sodium, or dantrium diluting the pigment using intravenous fluids, administration of mannitol, which we know is an osmotic diuretic, sodium bicarb, and Lasix to flush the kidney have been advocated to prevent renal failure. Um, okay, that's the end of this segment, and I will be right back, and we'll uh, try to either finish this up. We may have to do two more, so stay tuned.